You're listening to Low Profile. I'm Mark Lee Morrison, and this is Whisper by Martin Rev on the turntable here in the Chaos Production Studio in Olympia, Washington. Today, Madison Nadine and I are speaking with Martin about his formative years as a jazz musician and how that led to the formation of the seminal synth-punk duo Suicide. He also lays out his artistic process behind his solo work and sets the record straight on a handful of misconceptions that the well-meaning citizens of the internet have gotten twisted. This show is listener-supported through donations and in-kind support from Rainy Day Records, Old School Pizzeria, San Francisco Street Bakery, Schwartz's Deli, and Schurler Easy Premium Shitty American Lager from Three Magnets Brewing, all independent local businesses in Olympia, Washington. You can make a flexible monthly donation and gain access to bonus material like the unedited version of the interview you're about to hear by visiting patreon.com slash lowprofile. I would love to be doing this show full time and make even more episodes and your donations and spreading the word about Low Profile can help make that a reality. So again, if you can, visit patreon.com slash lowprofile and get involved. Also, if you want to take a peek behind the curtain, I've started a new Facebook group to interact with you. Just look up Low Profile Listener Hub there and you'll find it. And finally, you can find more about this episode, as well as previous episodes, at lowprofilepodcast.com. Martin Rev's portrait for this episode was painted by Nathan Burko Gibson. All right, let's get to it. Here's me and Madison talking to Marty. Love ya. This is Low Profile. I'm Mark Lee Morrison, and my co-host today is Madison Nadine. Hi. Our guest is none other than Martin Rev. Martin is one half of the groundbreaking duo Suicide and is also a prolific solo artist with nine albums to his credit. In Suicide, he, along with vocalist Alan Vega, paved the way for countless electronic artists for generations to come. Their songs have been reinterpreted by an astonishing array of artists, including Henry Rollins, LCD Sound System, REM, MIA, and Bruce Springsteen. But Martin's foundation lies in the doo-wop records he heard as a child and the avant-garde jazz he was immersed in coming of age in the 1960s. Martin, thank you so much for joining us on Low Profile. Sure. You're welcome. So, uh, how, how's New York? You, you've seen it evolve. You've been there your whole life. Yeah, it's, uh, it's okay with me. I mean, the great thing about New York that I don't find uh, almost anywhere else is the uh, quantity of goods and services here. I mean, you know. <laughs> sure. I was born here. So, as you, I think you mentioned, and, uh, my intrinsic memories uh, were experienced here for the most part. Very good. Cool. Yeah. I wanted to maybe start off by asking about your younger times and like when you started playing music and like what was influencing you, like what was inspiring you? Well, Turns out my, my father, uh, I mentioned this before, but he was probably the most innately gifted musician I ever met in my life. Uh, mm-hmm. He never read a note, never studied a note, mm-hmm. and he would just rattle, run off one, one song after another, probably singing with him too. And my mm-hmm. brother who was then taking lessons and, um, uh, my mother played. She had studied the piano as, as a girl. Still played, knew how to play. And before I had lessons, I would hear them kind of like jamming on these songs. And I would, uh, I was uh, compelled to join the band. So I, I put some marbles in a plastic 
like food containers, small one, and shook them, and they made a great sound. And I joined them as a percussionist. Too. <laughs> they didn't <laughs> cool. seem to mind. You know. Yeah. Oh, yeah that's and great. Uh, they accepted me, of course, <laughs> right away. I mean, that's about as early as I remember definitive music experiences. Cool. I read on your recommendation uh, <laughs> the book by Chris Needs, Dream Baby yeah. Dream. When I was reading about your uh, fascination with doo wop, and uh, mm -hmm. there was a lot in there about this album called "The Paragons Meet the Jesters," mm -hmm. which I had never heard before. But later that day, um, my family went out on a drive, and we saw a yard sale, and they had a box of records mm -hmm. that I thumbed through. Nothing, nothing at all that I was interested mm -hmm. in, and then. The very back of the box was that album that uh -huh. like the same day this yeah. like hours just a few hours later mm -hmm. that morning i had never heard of it and now it was like before noon and i owned it <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. lucky you <laughs> fantastic stuff and yeah. um, I feel like that that really at its core has stayed with you over the years well through. even more it's, and it's a, more than maybe or more specifically not a fascination but it was the music I, I in all my uh, generation grew up with that was a, that was our that was everything that was listened, played, coming down the radio constantly, and when you went to dances and you met someone and you fell in love, and it was all to do up. That was the music of the time, and then in the 60s, you know, 60s do up, 50s do up. So yeah. that was, uh, yeah, sure, it stayed with me. I think most people who grew up hearing a certain kind of music, that always stays with them. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about it, though, like, uh, much of it, like any genre that has any quality at all, still holds up. And, uh, you know, the best of it is the mediocrity and the stuff that's more trivial and throwaway. But, so it's, it's a great uh, musical chapter hmm. in the history of... Uh, music in the history of my experience of music and what what were you doing um, musically when you first started performing because I know that you, you segued from the the doo-wop uh, into the yeah sort of this emerging new forms of jazz that were coming to life before your very eyes like I know you you maybe saw God's favorite piano player, Thelonious Monk. <laughs> um, God's William. favorite? Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, it might be. Sure. One of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what was that like? Well, I started playing. I did my first gig, you might say, at a church at 15 years old. So hmm. it wasn't a special thing. It was with a saxophone player, you know, and for maybe a handful of people in, the, in their little uh, lunch room or whatever at night or whatever it was. You know. I mean, so we're talking about a good five years before suicide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I played with a lot of, and I had my own group around this time, right before and during the beginning of suicide. And different different settings, some of them were not necessarily my ideal setting but I was going I was working in places I was like going to hotels and things as I you know here and there sometimes for one night bungalow colonies it wasn't always uh, 
invigorating spiritually. <laughs> mm -hmm. But sure. I, I was, uh, basically, I was a musician. I knew that that's what I was going to be, and that's what I wanted to be. Was that making ends meet for you? Or? No, I was still a kid living at home. But, oh, right, you know, sure. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect it to uh, cover everything. <laughs> it, yeah. mm -hmm. it didn't for many, many years, even after I wasn't. Yeah, when did you move out? How old were you? 18. Mm. So is that about when you started getting out to the to the clubs? Um, I guess so. I had, I've been to a couple of clubs before that. I'd gone to uh, Underage. I had seen Monk play. Um, I had been to uh, Birdland, Underage too. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Sonny Rollins and other people. Mm -hmm. um, one time, uh, a five spot cafe downtown in New York, where Monk made his his uh, very pronounced uh, mark in New York after many many years. Of course, it wasn't you know he was always he had made a mark, but he had an extended engagement there, and that's where I heard him. But a friend of mine who was also a musician, his father uh, said, hey, that's going on. Why don't I, I'll take you out there. It was like a Sunday afternoon. And they had about five or six groups all, you know, coming on one after the other. And one of them was uh, Eric Dolphy. Yeah, wow. Uh, right before he went to Europe, actually. Oh, like, a, yeah. like a quintet. I think it was Bobby Hutchison playing vibes. And mm. Joe wow. Chambers on drums. I mean, a lot of, you know local people people were living most of the musicians lived then on the lower east side or on the five spot a couple lived uptown hmm. so and that was great it was a surprise too because we had been listening my friend who's a trombone player billy we had been listening to all the new records as they came out and a lot of eric we discovered eric delphi together mm -hmm. and um so yeah, and I'm you know after that, there were a few years when oh yeah I used to go to the Village Vanguard quite a, quite a bit and uh, Village Gate a couple of times I used to see Miles Miles Davis hmm. and various other groups especially at the Vanguard because I used to get it for free uh, I used to you know I just had that arrangement kind of eventually with people I knew down there and Max Gordon was the proprietor and I'd go down and catch a lot of people Monk especially many several times yeah wow. Miles too and uh, so those are the clubs I was going to most of the rock at that time were in much bigger stadiums except you know some of these smaller places that had you know like bar mm -hmm. bar music and then there were you know there were a few years when uh I didn't necessarily go to the clubs that much, I, I think. I, got to, I don't seem to remember, but I started, of course, in the uh, then with my own groups, and uh, and then with Suicide. Eventually, we were going quite a bit because we were just going to Max's and CBGBs. And yeah, well, your just, uh, your group was yeah. uh, Reverend B. Right. I was kind of wondering how you're starting your your jazz group Reverend B um, segued into the next chapter yeah. of your life musically. Well, Reverend B was like a it was just an improvisational group that I would call people I knew, and it would change for different shows too because different people were available, and it was like a free improvisation uh, setting, you know. I started playing electronic improvisation. I was doing that also with, uh, there was a good friend of mine, uh, or a good player that I knew very well, Steve Titwise. Anyhow, he started a group and asked me to join him. This is around, even a little before Suicide 2, around the same time when I had my own. But, you know, we play gigs like we play with outdoor stages. And, uh, they didn't have, you know, anything like that. So they would bring a, an electronic keyboard, whatever it was. And usually I wouldn't play it before. I wouldn't, wouldn't, didn't know until I hit it right on stage. And, uh, of course, by that, his stuff was a little more rehearsed because he had 
stuff that he wrote and wrote with other people mm -hmm. or you know a little more arranged and uh, yeah you know that that's uh, from there I was also what well, I had already been playing studying jazz for several years intently because I when I heard it and I eventually uh, didn't take that long I realized that's something I want to be able to do master it's incredible mm. yeah. I mean as, a, as an instrumentalist it was a incredible it was a wonderful challenge and a musical challenge and I guess I always gravitate towards those things doo-wop was of course never diminished in my love for it and it was always with me but as an instrumentalist I, I had a choice at some point with do up and I thought about it to go into s just writing songs and singing more and that would have taken me straighter into rock and roll mm -hmm. but as, a, as, as one playing as an instrumentalist that I wanted to master Jazz was the uh, challenge, the great challenge. And you just, just didn't do it overnight. It took years and years. Yeah. And uh, so by that time, I was a fairly pretty well-accomplished uh, jazz player by the time I was playing with Tim Weiss and in my own group. I had already actually evolved through the styles pretty much from bebop all the way through to, you know, what Miles was doing and whatnot, mm. into the avant-garde myself. Right. You know, not looking necessarily, I, I gotta do this, uh, go from one to the other, but they naturally evolved, like the music naturally evolved. I was involved with that avant-garde, that free improvisation, you know. Only I was doing it on the electric keyboards, because that was basically... Uh, the only choice you had, and, yeah. and I, st I really got into it. And the only person doing it then, who I hadn't heard yet doing it, was Sun Ra. Yeah. In that field, so you're always in a stage of assimilating and developing, and trying to reach what you don't know yet or don't know how to do yet. My time was the avant garde, you know, Cecil Taylor, Archie Shep. Yeah. Et cetera, et cetera, you know, and whatever was still open in those fields was still open in rock. You know, it was like 70s hadn't closed the door on rock and roll, on the evolution of the, of the, uh, of the, the movement. It was still going through changes. You had 60s, you had 70s rock, you had 80s. Because it was younger, it was newer. Mm -hmm. What I discovered right away with electronics, wow, this is a whole new frontier. The nice thing about it is when you become yourself, you're not, you're not finished at all either. Because you're constantly evolving through that. It's like kind of like an absurdist way to live your life and like allow things artistically to just kind of happen. Um, yeah. It's kind of, yeah, that's cool. I love that. Yeah, because you're living all that time. So mm -hmm. every, every time you're living, every time you, you, know, you get up and, you know, that day and you're still everything, all the juices, all the circulation, all the incredible amount of messages inside, all experiences, uh, are still going, you're still going, like that tree is still living. Right, yeah. So, I'm not satisfied, you know, if I, if I do something, it's not even conscious, I mean, mm -hmm. I'll go to a new album, you might say, idea, project, recording, with great ideas from the last. And at some point, it doesn't totally work for me. I don't want to do a process through it again. I mean, you want to you want to really turn yourself on. But even just that process, the process itself is uh, is also the essential thing. Mm -hmm. 
and people who work towards something to an unknown. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, or previously unknown in that sense. Not every aspect, but, and it has to do with also what you're finding in yourself in that moment too, in terms of your values, have you changed, you know. People change, you know, they could be going to discos when they're 19 and maybe at 26 they're not going to discos. Maybe they're listening to another kind of music or maybe they're doing this and that. Well, all that, if you're if you're recording music then, you might be reflecting a lot of the disco sensibility because that's what your sensibility is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But at some point you might say, well, wait a minute, man, you know. I don't really feel that anymore. I mean, I've been through that, and I don't feel it as much. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, now I've gone through other things. Maybe I've been in love. Maybe I've lost my love. Maybe I've had a child. Who knows? You know. And the tree has continually to continue to grow. Maybe I've heard a lot of other things too. Now I've heard a whole lot of uh, classical music, avant-garde classical, jazz, and all. You know. So my my reference is is broader. And that doesn't cover my whole life like it used to. Yeah. It doesn't right. take all of me. Well, you you were mentioning about starting one project and um, kind of picking up where you left off before. Um, and l- just thinking about, like, your most recent full-length album, uh, Demolition 9, mm-hmm. uh, kicks in with just uh, a sonic assault. <laughs> And then goes into the more orchestral pieces and even some doo-wop kind of feels. There's always um, mm-hmm. a link from one to the other, even though they're very different animals. Demolition 9, to me, felt like a logical culmination of everything that led up to that point. And you, you've referred to that album as being autobiographical. Actually, I didn't. Um... Oh, you didn't? Okay. No, but... My label with my partner at that time in the in the label, I think he was asked for a certain quote or something uh, for their distributors. Oh, okay. Soon after the journalist started saying that, because you know how they copy and paste each other all the time, man. Mm-hmm. So there's so much less individual thought, unfortunately. It was never on my mind to do an autobiographical record. Now, it may have turned out to be that way uh, in some senses, sure, because it's you. you know. But in a very general way, broad way, if they want to say, you know, stylistic, it's a way of trying to focus in and trying to describe the album to listeners, you know, like for reviews and things. Yeah. I'm going in, for the most part, on, you know, on anything like this that I do this way, it's uh, not knowing where it's going to turn out painters the same way I mean modern painters mm-hmm. yeah you know what especially abstract expressionists and I work basically with the the materials of music you know, mm-hmm. yeah of sound like my palette. Yeah. Paint there's a palette of colors. I draw on a palette of sounds, uh, which is incredibly varied or infinite, but the way they interact, the way they work together, the way they don't work together, uh, how they sound mm-hmm. to me, and how I can work with to modulate those, you know, flexibility of all that. I mean, that's to me the uh, the way to uh, 
kind of excites yourself in your work. And, and if you're not exciting yourself in your work, uh, okay. Many, like I say, many people don't have to. Their life is exciting enough. They're doing well enough. Or they, where they're not thinking enough. Maybe sometimes it's too much of a risk for many, for many varieties. And no, right. nothing to be judged. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I know that with suicide, a lot of the energy and intent that brought some of that on was your reaction to the Vietnam War. America, America is killing its youth. America, America is killing its youth. How does society influence your yeah, it's your like creation? A, it's like a response. I think it's different. Yeah. Yeah, it's different for different people who are, who, who are in creative fields. Mm-hmm. Some literally take events and things around them and reflect them even right. Uh, literal songs or, or pieces about them what, using them as titles. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, protest songs are just a simple example. Right. Uh, not a not profound example, but a simple one. I'm working with the music itself. So everything I'm living, the intensity, uh, the amount of money I have I don't have, especially, you know, don't have in those cases, especially in those days. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and the intensity of your life, your personal life, those are definite influences on you in a sense that you're dealing with them. You have to deal with them and you have a feeling about them. And you certainly usually have opinions about them and sometimes directions to take uh, in response. But you don't, yeah, to do it at the time is almost like uh, less productive. Uh-huh. It's like productive because, oh, I'm doing this because uh, my girl just left me today. Okay, maybe you're writing a song or something like that. Okay, great. You're going to write a great song with that or, or anything. If that gives you the energy, uh-huh. okay, but now you're still dealing with the song, the music of the song. Music has its own dictates, and now you're dealing with how one note against each other. That doesn't necessarily translate into your girl leaving you. The emotion of it could be, mm-hmm. if the song is clear enough and simple enough that way to express that it can be a very sad song wherever you do it but the song itself works under its own uh, under its own language Mm -hmm. so it's the way those notes are shaped and the way they follow each other if you play a melody about a sad song it can be a great melody it can be a terrible melody it can be a mediocre melody now you're working with those materials. Yeah. The notes. <laughs> the dynamics, the notes, how they're hitting each other, how it's hitting you. And if in the end it expresses this, uh, your life at that point, fine, but it's got to first express it in itself.
you've been listening to this uh, the suicide demo, you, you sing in a song <laughs> called Whisper. Yeah, 77. It was never a suicide demo. No? Whisper with Martin Rev vocals, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. it was never came out that way, and Whisper never came out as a suicide track, and Suicide never came out with that song. So It's a fallacy. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, I'm glad we can clear up some misconceptions today. Yeah, but yeah. it was misleading. I saw that, you know, I said, okay. I mean, it's not like it bothers me that much, but totally. it's like... It never came out that way. So when people see that, sometimes they think, oh, there's a suicide demo. I saw one comment. Where can I find that demo? Right. Huh. It was on Clouds of Glory. That's on Clouds of Glory. Oh. Mm. Not with the vocals. It's an instrumental. Right. Okay. That that's why I was... And that's, yeah. That yeah. That's the yeah. appearance of Whisper. Beautiful. Yeah. Later, it adapted uh, lyrics. And then I made that demo. Uh on a cassette with the uh, Clouds of Glory, with the original track, for a label, uh, Celluloid, that I thought might be interested in. Mm. Oh, cool. And uh, we didn't get anywhere further than that. And then I heard years later, people were starting to find it online. Huh. Funny how that yeah. happens. <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting that it even did, because there was only one copy, and I, you know, I gave it to uh, John Caracos of Celluloid, mm -hmm. and I don't. Then this is all pre-internet. Yeah. So now it's uh, fine. You know, I, I don't mind it coming out that way. I wonder if there's more Easter eggs like that hiding out there that are just gonna mm -hmm. find oh. their way to light. There might be in terms of whenever you have, uh, especially. Some demos, some uh, tapes. Yeah. More probably now with film, because when you do shows, so many people film now. Like everybody can do film on their phone, or they don't have a, many on a, on a better camera, too. Or, there's a lot of that stuff around, I'm sure. I mean, yeah. How do you feel like that is the, like, a proprietor of, you know, of published yeah. content? <laughs> I don't get into that. Yeah. Yeah, whatever it is, I, I don't like I try I'm not into trying to control that because it's too broad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I'm too busy with other shit that that I wanna do, I wanna be interested in. Yeah. But people filming and people even taping sometimes from an audience, I mean that's the that's the way it is now, you know. Yeah. And putting sure it on enough. YouTube too when you think about it. Uh, that's broadcasting it. So, but they do it. That's, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm not uh, going to spend too much time on that. You're not going to be <laughs> upset if more people listen to your work. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, that's yeah. what they, they know that too. I mean, yeah. not that they know. YouTube knows that too in a way that they, mm -hmm. it's definitely a promotion and it's good to uh, have it for me even to see because a lot of times I want to watch myself Mm -hmm. in a performance because I learned from that you learn from seeing yourself as well as doing it Another thing I was wondering if you could straighten out. Go ahead. I've always been curious about the Springsteen connection. Okay. I yeah. mean, the version I've heard in folklore primarily is that y'all were recording in the same studio, like a few doors mm -hmm. down from each other. Mm -hmm. Springsteen's people, his management or whatever, didn't want him to, you know, indulge in drinking or smoking or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would come and hang out with y'all in your studio, and that's... Well, I mean, it's interesting to hear because I've never heard that. I'm not saying it's not true, but that is never what I heard. Ever. From our perspective, is that Rick... Rick Ocasek. Uh, yeah, Rick Ocasek had just finished the final 
assemblage and mixing of the record, you know, producing it, I think it was pretty much done. Rick asked, went over and asked Bruce, and maybe Bruce had asked him at some point too, because Bruce had already been familiar with us, I think, very much so. Sure. And that's when Bruce came in and he stood up at the control room and listened to the whole thing. And that's all I ever knew or heard, and Alan never knew or heard, because he never mentioned that. Nobody ever mentioned it. Uh, obviously, the smoking and the drinking was being done in his studio. Is that what it was? Yeah, by other musicians. Huh. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I never heard it before. So, <laughs> Did you ever see him again? Uh, after that, I didn't. Mm. No. No. Not personally. When did you get wind that he was uh, he was playing Dream Baby Dream? That was years later. Yeah, when I you know I was somebody I guess we were working with sent us an email sent individually. What and I said you gotta hear you know this you gotta hear this. Dream Baby Dream. Dream baby dream An unreal baby dream An unreal baby dream And then I went up and I saw it Whenever that first year was that he started doing it on his tours, live tours oh. as an encore yeah, I guess it's still his show closer It's been for at least 15 closer, years probably. Wow Yeah, every night Yeah, I got to see him do it once uh, Probably about uh-huh. s- Five years ago oh. or so, mm. and oh, so you're still doing it five years ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. and I think by then all his fans were singing along too, so it was it was pretty special. Yeah. Well, it was an interesting thing then was that most people, except the journalists, right away uh, copped it, copped on it mm-hmm. online. He said he's doing a suicide song. I'm sure most of his fans, uh, those gigs, they didn't know that they didn't most maybe never even heard of suicide right and uh so it was a discovery for them when they started reading finding out uh, that's what it was and uh you know i never gave the boss a chance until after i heard about this <laughs> alleged encounter i'm like oh well if he's down with suicide he's got to have some stuff i'm gonna like and <laughs> yeah then i heard yeah uh-huh. like state trooper and Mm -hmm. that whole record and I was like okay so with Suicide you guys notoriously didn't generally rehearse especially in the like you know probably the second half of the career at least you kind of just show up and do your gig and you do what you do right I would rehearse myself and Alan was writing lyrics all the time and I was doing I would play you know, and I would play at, my, at home in my own studio. So, in a sense, that's rehearsing. We just didn't rehearse together. We didn't call our a group rehearsal, you might say. And solo gigs are the same thing. I'm always, you know, I would play uh, several, several times between shows. And of course now that's, there's no other members, so that's the rehearsal specifically. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then show up that way, yeah. But we never, <laughs> you know, it never had to be, of course, as I'm sure you, you know, it wasn't a, a pre-programmed, uh, orchestrated, choreographed set like that. Because now, we go in directions sometimes based on what the other's doing too sometimes. Alan might have a a bunch of words from lyrics going around his head and he might hear that he hears something I'm doing, which is what used to happen in rehearsals. And he tries them out on it. So it never got you know, it it had a longer expectancy life than when it got uh, really kind of formulated. A song you have to do it a lot of times like that yeah. and that was okay too I mean that's what when we did the first album we were doing just about all those songs and most of them for several years before that 
you also existed as a trio before it became just the two of you. And as far as I know, um, there's not recordings of that, but... Alan had a, another visual artist friend named Paul. Mm. And Paul would, had a guitar and he would play like sound free guitar. And Alan was trying to get some kind of electronic sounds out of a, a, a two track Wallensack tape recorder. And he was beyond the floor trying to make it feedback. That's where they were when I met them. And so we started putting a group doing it as a group and looking to get shows uh, there were three of us and soon after maybe a year uh, and we used to rehearse and two quite a bit the three of us Paul announced he really had to leave he wasn't going to continue he was interested in filmmaking so that's where the duo came in got it yeah. and one time uh I had asked my wife, Mari, to come down and play drums. Cool. And she did. And she was great. Cool. Wow. Is that, was that just a one-time thing with the drums? It was one time for various reasons, not because of the quality of what she did, uh, but for practical reasons, too, and, and for us and for the way we were living uh, and rehearsing and hours there were kids at home at that time yeah mm -hmm. young ones <laughs> i knew what a fine great musician she was mm. uh, in general she's basically a great visual artist but she had musical background and knowledge is incredible and uh, exposure and i think based on almost like a might have been a crisis in our relationship at that moment at the time mm -hmm. I thought I asked her to come down and do it because I thought maybe that would make us closer that's how kind of you know nuts you can be sometimes when you're in love and you're oh sure you mm -hmm. know you look for solutions that are not necessarily the long term solutions right but she did it and she was great but it didn't set it didn't sail and between she and I our relationship was as much in love as we were it was very uh dynamic but very uh would you say uh energized from our lifestyles and i was out a lot and playing and or just on the streets mm -hmm. after that there was an opening for a drummer and i had no other interest even before mari mm -hmm to have a drummer because what was working for me was this world of electronics that, that was the, that I discovered that was so fresh that was the, the new world you know that was a new frontier yeah right. and I heard all the stuff I needed to hear the percussion we do shows like the first shows uh, Mercer Arts Center mm. in those places that eventually became you know a real gateway for all the groups on the scene and, and no it, you know it, the beats the drones the, the overtones the uh, feedback that was all i mean it was percussive it was everything Sagittarius. I was always, especially in those days, I was really in, much more in space, mm -hmm. sound, space to me. Mm. And Alan, in a very good way too, God bless him, was practical 
in certain ways as an artist, yeah. no, he had no limitations or no bounds to keep going. And but uh, he saw the practicality of how he can kind of get this going in the world, <laughs> always before I did. Or he's more interested in that, you might say. Mm. Yeah. So, so he felt the drums were going to, you know, that's the way we got to go next. That's the way we should do it. And I knew, too, that that was a good space to develop, to fill. Yeah. But I, would, I resisted putting in another drummer, especially after my Mari had been there once mm -hmm. and I wasn't going to substitute her. Mm -hmm. That made it very clear to me, you know, that w mm -hmm. where I was going to go. It's either going to be no drums or it's going to be her mm -hmm. or it's going to be something else. Mm -hmm. Also, if I had been in a band where our gigs were considered kind of like there, there, there was often a lot of conflict, the gigs, and I wouldn't bring my wife to play a show where she might be in danger of getting a chair thrown at her or something like that. Yeah. Is it true that there was a show you played, I think at the Mercer, where the audience actually got locked in so they couldn't leave? <laughs> Have you heard this before? Have you heard of that one? <laughs> I've heard it, but I think it was, a, it was a, a rumor or a feeling that the audience had because they felt so, yeah, suffocated. And the blue room where we were playing that night and a couple of times was like a middle passageway for that whole floor. So to leave the floor, you had to, in a way, you had to walk through the, the blue room. I remember uh, David from the Dolls, and the Dolls, they finished their gig a little before us. A lot of people he was with were like, uh, what the, you know, what is going on, man? Mm -hmm. Let me out of here. And David... He took out his harmonica right away from his pocket and he got up right on stage. He said, let me blow with you guys. And he started jamming with us. There you go. It may have been the first time. You may have heard us before because we had all been doing shows. We did a couple before that in the Mercer Arts, too. But you had a New York doll on your team for that <laughs> night. That's, yeah, well, that's not it, a was, bad uh, thing. it was there. He was there. Did you, did you try and stay on the sidelines of all the, you know, the business end of the wrath of the unsuspecting crowds, <laughs> were you pretty safe most of the time, or did you did you get hurt? I never got hurt. It came very close, uh -huh. mm. and of course, Alan, being in front of me, usually, human shield, <laughs> human shield. He did get hurt Aww. several times. I remember one time I tossed out a ride cymbal. I was playing drums in those days too with the keyboard. Yeah. I'd play them both together. And I took off the ride symbol and I just sailed it right to it. And luckily, there wasn't a big audience, and luckily, it didn't hit anybody. Oh, man. <laughs> and I remember one time at the Blue Room, you know, I, we were engaged. Of course, Alan was engaged in confrontation. Mm. At the time, I had a glass of water, and I just threw out the water onto the early tables before me. Not the glass, but. But there were shows like that, but most of the shows, I mean, I was always so into basically the sound and what I was doing, the music as I was doing it, and what we were doing that right. it wasn't as important to me. I think, you know, that's part of Alan's, that's, that's his view. Yeah. That's right. where he wants to go. So I would play off him in various ways, sometimes doing the exact opposite most of the time. Most of the way we dressed the way we stood, where we stood. Yeah, I you know. I'm, I definitely wanted to touch on fashion, if now's a good chance to maybe like elaborate on that and like mm -hmm. that influence too with your music as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty that, iconic. Well, well Alan, was, Alan was way ahead of, I'm sorry? Pretty iconic. <laughs> uh, maybe it was because we were early, but we were just yeah. doing, uh, if Alan cut his jeans or Mm. Even cut himself with a razor blade when he wasn't even playing. I mean, mm. it was he was it was coming out of him. It wasn't his own sense of this is going to be fashionable. Right. So it was later, ironically, a couple of a few years later, of course, after we called ourselves punk and whatnot. Right. That people, you know, you know, there was you know, you could buy a razor blade to hang around your neck. It was like hip, mm. uh, facsimile, and you could. You know, cutting your clothes and putting holes in them. And, uh -huh. 
and calling ourselves punk. And a journalist came in and they said, let's call this, this is punk music. Yeah. Now it's like maybe 75, I'm getting up 76. Mm. We started discovering it. For, the journalist started discovering it. put a tag on it for the mm. broader media, you might say. Yeah, mm. yeah. And we were doing it in 71 only because, hey, that's a cool thing to call it. So we were always looking for names for our shows, you know, different things to call. Whenever we'd get them. Punk Mass. Say, How about, yeah, Punk well, Music, like. that's great. Yeah, music. Punk Mass is cool. Mm -hmm. Punk Mass came around the same time. And the uh, interesting thing is that the last gig we ever did, which was the Barracon in London, was billed as a Punk Music Mass. And the Barbican felt it was, uh, this is the end, this is the closing of the circle for suicide. This is like, mm. come all this way, and this is the closing of the circle. They're calling it a place the way they advertise it. Mm. And I just thought and said, maybe, also, well, it's not necessarily the closing of the circle. The circle's not necessarily closing here. Right. But okay, I understand what you, what you mean, but mm -hmm. why the closing? Right. Like yeah. But ironically, it, it was a close end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the mm -hmm. suicide circle in terms of performances yeah. is the last one. Right, but that tree still grows. Yeah. So punk mass is, is cool, but it's not something I, I, I feel I need to hold on to or live with, you know, indefinitely, you know, after, after when it was used in a significant way. It was like, done, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's in your back pocket. You want to talk about the book that you asked me about, the uh, Bluesberry, Bluesberry book? For a second? Right, by Andy Coulter, just called Suicide, with the, and it's... It's part of the 33 and a third series from Bloomsbury right. Publishing. Right. And basically, kind of my takeaway, because I read the um, actual biography um, by Chris Needs as well. And uh, uh -huh. it's kind of like a cliff notes of yeah. the middle yeah. third yeah. of the biography. It's, it's just like kind of truncated paraphrase and then some yeah. of the stories are like kind of flipped from another perspective where say it's like, you know, the kids from Primal Scream or Joy Division or, um, you know, in the audience and you, you kind of yeah. see it through their eyes. So it's, it's a little bit, it's a little more cinematic, almost like a almost like yeah. a screenplay yeah, totally. a little bit like a comic book too I guess. Totally. Yeah. Right. well because they bring in she she brings in the uh the ghost rider comic yeah. book series into the sort of right, subtext right, right. and tries to yeah. i mean you know make a connection where maybe there isn't one maybe there is but um well the only thing that that i saw right away that made it difficult for me to read it <laughs> but that's just me Mm -hmm. because I knew what happened in those incidences. Yeah. And, right. and they were very far off what the, some more, some less, mm. of the reality of those instances that she is, a, she's a fine writer. Like yeah. Anne, somebody. And uh, it's a fine conception, but reading it myself and knowing how, hey, you got that name wrong, you got that, dialogue wrong, you got that thought wrong, it didn't happen that way, it didn't happen that way. Mm. And that makes it painful for the person who lived it, I think, to read it a little bit, because yeah, it's like rewriting history, as opposed to Cliff Notes, maybe. Right. You know, if you want to read uh, War and Peace, and you read the Cliff Notes, <laughs> you're still getting, I think, yes, a uh, capsulization of what was in the book. You get the you get the basics, the basic idea. You get the basics, but you get the facts of the way the books. You know, in other words, there's a year in a book, it gives you the same year. Mm -hmm. right. If there's a name in a book, it gives you the same name. Mm -hmm. If it goes into that, see, if there's a war in a book, it gives you the same war. See. Yeah. Yes. So that's why cliff notes were valuable to use for that. <laughs> sure, sure. If this is seen as cliff as cliff notes, 
And I don't see why it wouldn't be seen as true by people who just come into it now and want to read about the group. They don't know that much yet, or they haven't read Chris's book, or right. even if they have. It's very easy to believe everything the way it went down in the book, because that's that's what you're exposed to. Yeah. Right. So in a way, it's a responsibility, and I'm not going to say she neglected it at all. That's her responsibility to know what that is, but... You're kind of writing history or rewriting it. You see? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if that was the only book I ever read about suicide, say, yeah, I'd have a close picture of what happened, but I also have a lot of the details wrong. And a lot of details were important. To, you know, like how how did Alan and I actually meet? When, where, what did we say to each other? What did you say to each other when you met? Well, the, the first time we met is when he was with Paul on the floor of the museum because he had the key to that loft, that art mm-hmm. space. Mm-hmm. And I heard them, and I was looking for a space to get out of the cold, and it was unlocked, the floor. I don't know if it was seven in those days. Pretty high up. And I went right up, and, it, and, the, and the, the further I got up, I started hearing sound. Huh. And the first time... When I walked in, I heard the sound. I saw what they were trying. They, they were trying to do sincerely, make sound. I sat down on the floor, gallery floor, and I found these uh, metal. I don't know what they were, industrial springs or something, you know. So I had two of them, and I went back down and sat down, and I started rhythmizing, rhythmizing to what they were doing, mm. like like putting a drum track to it. Cool. Eventually, they it stopped, and I don't know what we said after that, except that uh, that particular night, maybe just, of course, maybe he asked, said, how you doing, and said hello, and all this stuff. And, uh, mm-hmm. Sure. And that was it for that night. You know, I mean, it was, uh, but after that, and Alan tells the story of how, after that, we kind of knew each other, because we were both hanging out there a lot, and Alan mm. was like an official member of the board, which was the artists who showed the repertory uh, co-op. You know, they didn't want, they never hung out there. They were more established and they didn't hang out at night. Alan needed a place to hang out at night. Mm-hmm. And he would mm-hmm. sleep on the floor of the place too, of the museum. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he would duck out there. I would duck out there because my, where I was living was still uptown in Manhattan. So we'd find each other there. And then I got another gig there. And I remember the gig was, Alan talks about that somewhere, about how how that was walking into that gig for him. Mm. I think it's Kristen's book, maybe, too. And he happened to somewhere later on in the evening, as as it went on late, he picked up a tambourine and he just started playing, you know, hitting himself, you know, playing with the tambourine to, to the music. I think it was about maybe 10 musicians that night mm-hmm. with me. Yeah. A couple of sax players and trumpet players. And when it was over and uh, everybody went home, because that's what everybody would do after a gig, you know, mostly, you know, you play the gig, go home. You know, hopefully get paid and go home. Well, I don't know, we're always the last ones to go anywhere. Which is kind of like the way, you know, what rock was, and rock was to me too, it was like a, a communal thing, like it was almost like living with people, you know. That's the great groups come out of that too. You know? how, how many times have you been approached about, your, your full last name is Reverby, which re- yeah. it reads as Reverby, and it just seems like so, so prophetic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but but mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Has that been pointed out to you a lot? No, actually not that much, but here and there. Occasionally, one person in a guitar, a music store, guitar center, asked you when I was buying something, she said, wow, that's, that's like reverb with a Y. That's like really, I think she's the only one who ever pinpointed that to me. But uh, yeah, reverb B, it's like it'd be like a, an adjective of a sound, right. a reverb, a moon of a mood, mm-hmm. a, a noun, a reverb to feel reverb. You know, yeah. That room, that, that sound is very reverb or reverb. You know, I guess. Mm-hmm. 
thank you for making time to talk. It's been really nice and it's been good to hear about over the years and you know. Oh good, I'm glad. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Dream come true, one for the bucket list. Yeah. (laughs) Well you're the people if I'm gonna talk about dreams you know, I would hope that they I talk about it with guys like you because you're cool. You're okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, you too, Marty. Back, back at you. Thank All you the so best. much. Okay. All right. Yeah. All Take the care. Best. You too. Ciao. Ciao. Thanks for listening to Low Profile. If you want to learn more about Martin Rev, you can find some cool links at lowprofilepodcast.com. And if you'd like to support this show, please visit patreoncom lowprofile. We'll see you in a couple weeks with Richard Young's.